it. Harvold Crab Graven with us. So thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so I just, is the PowerPoint? Um, a apresentação está disponível já? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so my name is Ingrid. I'm from the University of York, uh, and I'm very happy to be here. It's really nice to be in this um, community of a combination of scientists, policymakers, and academics. I don't think I've ever experienced this kind of combination before. I'm used to more either academic conferences or policymakers. So. I think that this is really great um, and that we can, um, I think these communities often talk past each other, so this is a good opportunity to, to engage. So I'm going to try to be a little bit short um, and leave 10 or 15 minutes for questions and discussions afterwards. Um, but generally, um, I consider my uh, role here right now uh, to, to be to kind of bring the big picture, the political economy perspective, uh, kind of the politics of how we should approach or how we approach uh, poverty, inequality, and technology for development. So there's been a lot of talk yesterday about the importance of science and what, the role that science can play. Uh, and I think that there is a lot of uh, scope for science and technology to play an important role. Uh, but, you know, science doesn't exist in a vacuum. There's a lot of politics and economics around um, scientific advancements, measurements of progress, who, measure, who decides what we should measure, who pays for it, what to end, uh, and uh, what's the reporting like. So that's kind of the, the spirit of the talk right now. So I'll start very basic about why we have goals anyway. So we're talking about the SDGs, right? Sustainable Development Goals. But the questions of why we have them hasn't really been asked, um, and, and it hasn't been approached in a systemic way in, in these academic, uh, political, and scientific communities. Um, what are the SDGs? I'll go a little bit into that, although I think uh, most of you know that. Um, why we have them, who they serve, who's accountable, and what is the understanding of development that underpins the Sustainable Development Goals. And then I'll bring in inequality and poverty and technology uh, as examples. Uh, and conclude. And also, we have the SDGs. They might be flawed, but they're here to stay for the next uh, 10 years at least, 11 years. Um, so how do we make the best of them? Um, so why have global goals? Um, this is a question that I started uh, thinking about with a co-author four years ago now. Um, and we thought about it in general, but also how it applies to global goals generally. Um, so why have goals? Some of us have goals in our personal lives, in our professional lives. Uh, we have to deal with global goals. Um, they could have a motivational role, was one of the first things that we came up with. Uh, you set yourself a goal that could uh, give you an intrinsic motivation to work towards that goal, right? Uh, it could also, if you tell other people about the goal, or other people, or policymakers have similar goals, that might, might also create some extrinsic uh, motivations. You're doing it to um, impress others or to maybe show your um, uh, electorate that you're achieving the goal. It could be a, you know, that could be a plausible good reason to set goals. Coordination rule. Um, so goals, if you're not setting the goals alone but with others, uh, that could be useful. Also in the context of global goals, you avoid overlap, you avoid um, uh, duplication. This is particularly relevant in the context of aid, right? Uh, where there's uh, the OECD DAC has set uh, goals related to coordination for even before the SDGs, but untying aid uh, and using uh, country programs rather than um, uh, like I think Tanzania is like the worst case scenario where they have uh, donors uh, using their own. Uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation systems rather than the country system, so the country has to then um, spend a lot of energy uh, and time reporting within these different systems. So coordination could be another plausible 
um, uh, positive contribution of, of global goals. Epistemic is an important one, how we think about development, uh, what the goals contain frames how we think about development. Uh, there's been some important work on this by um, Sakika Fukudapar and Desmond McNeil. Um, they're looking, they looked, um, a while ago they looked at how the MDGs shaped how we talked, how we thought about development and how there was sort of a shift towards thinking about development as poverty reduction um, rather than something more structural. And they've also done a lot of work on the SDGs, how they shape our thinking about development. Um, so the, the question is, can the SDGs serve these, these roles? And are goals always of use? Uh, it's also worth thinking about, now that we live in an era of goals, we're almost just assuming that the more goals, the better, more targets, the better, more indicators, the better. Um, but there are many things that we do in our personal, professional, and political life that, where we don't use goals, right? They might be relevant in a certain context, uh, but the, having very specific goals might not always be positive because things change, uh, our knowledge of the world changes, um, and uh, so sometimes we need to adapt. Um, so, keeping on like how we can think about goals, a couple of different um, uh, aspects of flexibility is one of them. Goals might be good uh, because to determine what we want to achieve. Uh, but as I mentioned, things change. Um, we, there needs to be some flexibility. If we decide we want to end poverty uh, within a certain time frame, within a certain country, uh, how we do it might change depending on the context. And also, uh, um, also on our knowledge of what's going on in the context, right? Um, so there must be some flexibility to plan and revise. Um, and the targets may not be, it might not be useful to have the targets set very concrete from the get-go. Uh, the world and our knowledge might change over time. Um, accountability is another one. So this is also, some say we live in an era of accountability. We have over 200 indicators. Um, and some of the reasoning for why we needed the MDGs a um, long time ago uh, was that we needed to increase accountability, especially um, of uh, uh, recipients to the donors. Um, so if you believe that accountability is important, then goals um, uh, should somehow outline who is accountable um, or what combination of actors are accountable. And to enjoy legitimacy, uh, you would think that in a context of global goals, everyone should have some responsibility and it should be somewhat equally shared. Um, coordination, as I mentioned, um, untying of aid, working through country systems, um, working across sectors is very important as we've uh, several of the, the presentations yesterday were about working like across the SDGs, um, making connections between the goals, um, also to solve global problems. This is maybe like one of the most important reasons why we might want global goals, that we need to coordinate to, um, to tackle big important problems like climate change or how to deal with financial crises. How should goals be pursued? So assessment of success is another important aspect and this actually hasn't been talked about uh, that much um, in terms of the MDGs. I mean, it's talked about in terms of like the MDGs were a success, but what does that mean? Um, so Shortfall assessment is the most common way of uh, talking about success. Um, were the goals reached or not, basically. Um, progress assessment was also important to evaluate the MDGs. Um, so not just whether the goals were achieved or not, but what was the starting point and how far did a country get uh, from the starting point. And this was important because a lot of um, people were arguing that it's not really fair to just look at whether we achieve the target or not, or the goal, because countries have different starting points. So it's not fair for the countries that are coming from a very low starting point. Now, counterfactual assessment um, hasn't been uh, systematically um, evaluated by the UN. 
it has been evaluated by some academics. Uh, one of them was actually in the in UNDP, I think, or another UN organization, but he published it as an independent uh, scholar. And that, where because it's often claimed that the MDGs were a success, um, but compared to what, right? What if we didn't have the MDGs? Uh, would the same things have happened? How do we know that the MDGs is what caused um, poverty to be reduced? Uh, a counterfactual assessment could be important here. Um, so in context of the SDGs, um, how, we, how we assess what success means hasn't been agreed on uh, or really discussed in depth either. So given that kind of big picture of uh, roles that the goals could play uh, in theory, let's look at the goals that we have. Sustainable development goals. So why do we have them? Uh, I mean, now it's just assumed that we need them. It's very rarely asked, like, do we really need them? Um, but in 2010, basically, that's when this kind of assumption started, that the MDGs worked, we need new goals. The MDGs are running out, uh, we need something to uh, follow up, uh, basically. And that's when the UN started the whole process. Um, so the MDGs helped to lift more than one billion people out of extreme poverty. That's what Ban Ki-moon said in 2015. That's the MDG report that I'm sure many of you know. So if this is true, let's just take it as, uh, I know a lot of people have criticized the poverty measures, but if this is true, let's assume it's true, does it mean the MDGs were a success? Was it the MDGs that helped to lift more than one billion people out of extreme poverty? So this is the um, picture taken from that report where it's claimed that the MDG agenda proved that global action works. So poverty decreased. Did it have anything to do with MDGs? How can we know? We can't, right? There's so many other things going on in the world other than the MDGs. Um, there have been a couple of counterfactual studies, so I put the, um, the, um, the citations up there. Um, and they find, they look at how, how were, um, how was the world faring, at different, at different regions of the world, how were they doing on the different MDG goals, uh, the different MDGs and the targets, before the MDGs were introduced and after. Uh, if the MDGs were a success, you would think that there was an acceleration of progress after the MDGs were introduced, right? Um, and they find that generally this wasn't the case. Uh, in some goals there was even a deceleration. Uh, in, some goal, in some regions, there was an acceleration, uh, especially low-income, aid-dependent countries did have an acceleration in certain targets. Uh, but generally, uh, the trend of poverty reducing has been quite um, uh, consistent and not accelerated after the MDGs. So that goes against this whole uh, idea that we need global goals in order to achieve um, poverty reduction. And China is responsible for a large part of the, global, the reduction in global poverty, as we know. And did China pursue these policies, poverty reduction policies, because of the MDGs? I'll let some of the Chinese scholars here uh, answer to that. Um, but generally, yeah. So, oh, sorry, I need to go back. Uh, oh, I'm giving away my whole presentation. Okay, so it was assumed that we needed goals because the MDGs were a success. Um, so that's where we are now. We can't kind of go back, we have them. Uh, what are they? I won't talk about this too much because I, I know that you know. Uh, 17 goals, 169 targets. There was a lot of critique of the MDGs for being technocratic, for being very narrow, for focusing too much on poverty, and sort of people in the developing world as recipients of aid rather than as agents, um, for uh, interventions being very narrow rather than broad, for not focusing on systems. So the SDGs are much broader. They tackle structural issues. They tackle growth, employment, environment, uh, inequality, which was left out of the MDGs. Um, so they also tackle some sensitive topics that were left out of the MDGs, like, like inequality. 
Um, so there's a movement from the MDGs to the SDGs from very technical to structural transformation. Um, and they're considered to be universal. And that was also something that the MDGs were criticized for. It's us in the North, UN, New York, helping the people in developing countries. Um, whereas in the SDGs, actually, we're all, everyone's involved um, in theory. It applies to Germany as well as Malawi. Um, so there's the change in discourse uh, with SDGs, uh, which we would see as positive if we think about what we want to achieve with global goals, right? Um, who do they serve? So, well, they're supposed to be universal. So they're supposed to serve humanity. That's in the, the 2030 agenda. Um, but of course, they'll serve different people uh, in different ways, depending on uh, your interests, your roles, etc. cetera. Um, so in order to unpack who do they serve, I'll look a little, little, bit, little bit into who actually shaped them. It wasn't everyone. Uh, there were some constituencies. Uh, who is accountable? And who do they benefit? I won't have time to go into, but this is a question to kind of um, keep in mind. So who shaped them? So in contrast to the MDGs, they were shaped largely um, by um, UN uh, uh, bureaucrats and, and uh, in the global north. The SDGs were shaped in a much more participatory process. It included civil society. It included multinationals um, in several different ways. Uh, philanthropic foundations, it included, there was large country participation. Uh, so much broader. This was from 2012 in Rio uh, to 2015. Lots of co um, consultations even happening online um, that led to the formulation of the SDGs. A very political process as well. Um, lots of battles over what kind of language would be included. Um, so, and since then, there's been the formulation of the indicators, right? Um, which has been slightly separate um, and more narrow. It hasn't been as participatory as, as the um, development of the SDGs. Um, but they're very important because they are actually how we will measure the SDGs, right? So 232 indicators were developed uh, 2015 to 2017. They're still under development. Next year, um, they'll be reopened and we'll be able to revisit some of these. Um, but it's interesting that the, how we actually will measure the SDGs was actually, um, although it's also a very political process, it was, wasn't a part of the uh, broad coalition um, that shaped the 2030 agenda. So who is accountable? Very difficult question. Um, the high level political forum, HLPF, um, is the main mechanism. Uh, where we'll review and monitor how the SDGs have been implemented. There's a bunch of different reports that are associated with the HLPF. I'm sure many of you work on some of these. Um, so this SDG progress report, report annual, the Global Sustainable Development Report every four years. Um, thematic reviews, which are interesting because then that brings different UN agencies together, so it could be good for coordination. Uh, and the voluntary national reviews is how the governments are accountable, right? They have to, well, they should uh, produce a voluntary, voluntary national reviews where they are encouraged to look at all of the SDGs and all of the targets, but they can also choose to look at only some. Um, and they evaluate themselves how well they've done. Um, and then the QCPR review, which is actually for um, the ECOSOC program countries. So this goes a little bit away from the universality because it's only um, developing countries that uh, produce those reviews. Um, in the SDGs, as you know, there is a significant role for the private sector in development, um, but there aren't many mechanisms where they are held accountable. So the accountability is uh, more focused on the governments uh, that produce national reviews, but even there, they can choose themselves what they, what they want to focus on. So, the accountability uh, isn't very strong um, in the SDGs, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Depends on what, you, what your perspective is on that. Um, so what is the understanding of development that underpins the goals? It's a big question. So within the 17 goals, there are different um, approaches to development that uh, are, are within there. Uh, generally, it's very broad. 
includes the environment, uh, inequality, but also some aspects of like techno technical development. Um, there is a recognition that advanced countries uh, have, a, have a role to play as well as develop, developing countries, uh, some what of burden sharing there. Um, in the targets, there is somewhat of a movement from the structural, big picture, open way of looking at development to a more technical and limited way of looking at development. Um, becomes a little bit more prescri prescriptive. And of course, 169 indicators, that's a lot. But there's also a lot that is left out, of course. They don't cover everything that we might care about in the world. Um, 232 indicators. Now we're moving to uh, even more, maybe technical and, um, and prescriptive. And there might be a paradox of, of specification here, where, as I mentioned earlier, if you set a goal, there might be some things you want to change regarding how you actually want to achieve that goal. Um, and that might, that very specific uh, indicators might cause some problems for that. Uh, and burden of measurement. I could go on for a long time about this, but there's been a lot of work that is done on with a burden that we place on developing countries that have to uh, actually measure these 232 indicators. Um, so a question that has been asked basically since we started the work on the indicators um, has been, do they change the meaning of the SDGs? So this was also brought up, there was a meeting in the UN uh, earlier this month um, where a lot of people were arguing that actually the meaning is being changed. Um, so they are the main way that progress will be measured, so if the meaning is being changed, then that is a problem. Um, so G7, G7 and China were criticizing the indicators from the beginning, uh, arguing that it doesn't encompass all the goals and targets in a balanced way, that it prioritizes some over others, and particularly goal 17, which is the means of implementation goal, um, which is more about um, uh, the role that advanced countries play in the process, um, and sort of the developing world's way of holding advanced countries to account. Um, and, and they do also argue that the indicators change the meaning of, the, of the, um, some of the targets, again with the goal 17 being the most controversial for them. So many argue, and this was also argued at the, the meeting at the UN this beginning of the month, that there has been a narrowing. Um, and Fukuda Parr and McNeil also write about this. They have a special issue in the Global Policy Journal uh, on this with lots of academics and policymakers contributing, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, and they look actually, yeah, there's so many different case studies that we could talk about, but one of them is the role of human rights and women's rights. Uh, and they argue that that has been largely left out of the indicator framework, whereas that was a really a strength of the SDGs as a, the goals and the targets. So, uh, I've, st I'm, I've still only given kind of big picture about why we might need goals and why, uh, what role the SDGs might play in the political economy of the SDGs. So now I want to look specifically at inequality, poverty, and technology, um, which is what this conference is about. So those of you working on, on those aspects might be interested in, in thinking about that. So. Um, goal 10 is super ambitious. Reduce inequality within and among countries. So this is something that is a very hot political topic. Um, the company and targets are defined in terms of generalities or minor adjustments. So to empower and promote inclusion, very general. And actually it doesn't necessarily deal with inequality. Um, to reduce the transaction costs of migrant remittances. It's great, but it doesn't necessarily deal with inequality. Um, so it doesn't address the institutional arrangements in the world, nationally, globally, um, that have led to the increase in inequality, unprecedented levels that we've seen. Um, and the indicators also don't measure inequality. Uh, they measure basically inclusive growth. So. Uh, for example, income per capita of bottom 40% of the proportion of people. Um, yeah, income, sorry. Income per capita of bottom 40% is one of them, um, which is inclusive growth. You could have rising inequality 
uh, even if you're improving on that indicator. Um, and same with the other, the other indicator. So this is something that a lot of civil society organizations want to bring up next year when the indicators are, are revised. But it's a very political topic, so you know, it's unlikely that they'll actually be included. Um, so between country inequality, um, there are also, I mean, there's, okay, there's one indicator that's associated with the between country inequality, uh, which is the proportion of members and voting rights of developing countries in international organizations. So that's a very good goal uh, because it's skewed. The advanced countries have more power in international organizations than developing countries do. Um, but that isn't a measure of between country inequality, right? Uh, if you want to measure between country inequality, you have to look at con like measures of convergence, basically. Um, and in the vo voluntary national reports that came in 2016, there were lots of countries submitting them. Uh, no one actually um, mentioned this, <laughs> this uh, goal except China actually did mention it. Um, so that's kind of, it's there, it's in the goal, but it's been lost in the, in the indicators. So overall, the targets and the indicators associated with the go inequality goal are weak um, and incomplete. Poverty. So goal one, like the inequality goal, is very ambitious. End poverty in all its forms everywhere. So already much more general uh, and ambitious than the MDG. And the targets as well, I just pulled out a couple of them because, I mean, I know you've looked at these before. Uh, it includes equal rights to economic resources, social protection systems. Um, so looks at poverty in a, in a, broader, a broader sense. So looking at the means of implementation uh, for poverty, ensure significant mobilization of resources from a variety of sources, including through enhanced development cooperation. Also sounds very good, uh, but it's not very specific, right? Uh, significant rather than like actual numerical um, uh, measure, variety of sources rather than a specific source. Uh, enhanced development cooperation, as we know, can mean anything. Um, and the accompanying indicator, proportion of resources allocated by the government directly to poverty reduction programs. So there we've moved to, it's just the government spending more um, that is the means of implementation. It doesn't have, well, it has something to do with development cooperation, but not directly. Um, so uh, this is what the G77 in China were talking about when they, they were arguing that the indicators are changing the meaning of the SDG uh, or the 2030 agenda. Uh, and of course, this is like a lot of academics would say that, well, you know, if you look at the existing trends of poverty uh, uh, in the world, if, if we continue as we have 1993 to 2008, uh, it'll take 100 years to eliminate extreme poverty. And that's just at 1.25 a day that Woodward was looking at. Um, so his argument is that if you're not doing anything more structural um, than just kind of adding some social safety nets there, or um, adding, uh, investing a little bit more there, um, you might not actually, it's, it would, it's very implausible that we'll actually eliminate poverty by 2030, which is 11, in 11 years. Um, so, you know, it's very typical academics to, to, to point out the negative here. Um, okay, technology, so I just screenshotted the whole, um, uh, technology goal and the well these are the targets on the and the indicators from the, so this is part of goal 17 means of implementation um, so yeah don't read all of this but basically you can see that the the targets are fairly good uh, enhanced north-south and south-south and tri triangular regional and international cooperation um, etc the indicator the number of science and or technology cooperation agreements between countries by type of cooperation. So it could be that if you increase the number that that will actually lead to more cooperation, but that's you know, not really a, a logical assumption. Mm. It depends on what uh, the content of those agreements, right? Um, 
and another, another target, no, another indicator, fixed internet broadband subscriptions. Um, also doesn't have so much to do with um, uh, North-South collaboration. Um, another one, so, so a, an interesting uh, target that uh, was brought into the 2030 agenda is the te technology bank and science, technology, and innovation capacity building for least developed countries, very important. Uh, but then the indicator is the proportion of individuals using the internet. Mm. So definitely changing the meaning of that one. So technology obviously is very important for development. Um, but it's not just uh, you know, um, shipping technology to developing countries, making technology more accessible. It's also about um, how countries can become technology innovators themselves. Like developing countries that have moved to developed countries um, have all found ways to become producers of technology rather than just consumers, right? So, and that's also recognized in the WTO agreement, TRIPS, where um, they look at the, I mean, it's, a strength, it's about strengthening patents, uh, but there is a recognition that it is the global north that is generally mostly the producer of uh, technology and this global south, the consumer. Um, so there is also a clause saying that devel developed countries should also, um, should also transfer capacity to developing countries, but there isn't a mechanism to, to ensure that that actually happens. So this was kind of a part of the motivation behind the, this aspect of the 2030 agenda, that they wanted um, there to be some commitment for capacity building in, in um, developing countries, but in terms of measuring the outcomes that's largely lost in the SDGs. So, getting to my conclusion, um, and how to make the most of the SDGs. Um, so, I've now uh, given kind of a general view of why we want goals at all, what, what positive role the SDGs could play, the political economy of the SDGs, um, and also specifically looking at the inequality, poverty, and technology. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so evaluating the SDGs, so I talked about flexibility. Um, I would argue that the large number of indicators and targets um, d may distract from the larger goal, the larger goals uh, in the SDGs. Um, so they appear prescriptive and uh, development, you know, we don't know exactly how to do development, whatever that means. I'm sure each of you has a different definition. Um, and, but there is some assumption in the SDGs that we do know, and this is the way to do it. Uh, trying to achieve the indicators will lead to those goals. Um, so it doesn't really allow for experimentation that's, the, that's necessary, um, given that we don't really know. If we really knew, then you know, we would all be developed. Um, so there is some sort of uncalled for confidence in the 2030 agenda. Um, learning and also national democratic discussion. So in order for development to be um, effective and legitimate, you also want those in power in your own country to be accountable to you, right? So having a democratic discussion about how to achieve a goal um, could also actually be very effective. Uh, but that isn't, that's not really, uh, there's not really room for that in the 2030 agenda. Uh, of course, everything that counts can't be, everything that counts can't be counted, which a lot of people have brought up because the indicators are largely about what can be counted most easily. Um, but of course, even a lot of the indicators, there hasn't been agreement yet on how to actually measure them. Uh, it's very difficult. But there are a lot of things that count that can't necessarily be counted. Like, for example, um, effective health systems, building national systems generally, it's hard to evaluate with an indicator, although it's not impossible to monitor and like say something about their effectiveness. Um, accountability? as I talked about. Um, so there is this accountability discourse that I am sure you're all familiar with um, that's been strengthened with the increase in the amount of indicators that we have. 
But at the same time, actually, the mechanisms to hold anyone accountable isn't there. Um, so there's somewhat of a discrepancy where we're like, oh, well, this is, you know, uh, very specific and we're very clear about what needs to be achieved. Um, but who <laughs> is to be held responsible uh, isn't uh, really addressed. Um, and what is this success? Um, so there has been this large effort of you know new reports coming out, um, all these indicators, national reviews, but there hasn't been a discussion of what success actually means. Uh, UN has said to um, countries that are evaluating themselves that they can choose to do it however they want to do it. Um, so there. There's kind of a coordination uh, role that the goals could play, they had the potential to play, um, but that, uh, that opportunity is somewhat lost because we don't agree on how a success should be uh, measured. Uh, motivation? I mean, this is very difficult to measure. Uh, and there has been quite a lot of work on the MDGs evaluating whether they um, led to uh, increased efforts, development efforts. If, um, NGOs, national governments increased aid, increased their development efforts because of the MDGs, and there is uh, no lot of evidence that this actually was the case. Um, they definitely changed their language, the way they talked about development, to fit with MDGs, but did not necessarily increase resources or effort. But this is hard to measure, right? Um, so there's little evidence. Um, but, uh, coordination. So there's the national reviews are independent. The governments do them independently of other governments. So there's also, I mean, there could be some uh, coordination or some peer-to-peer -peer review or something like that. But it isn't. Um, it isn't formalized or institutionalized within the 2030 agenda. Uh, each government is just responsible for evaluating themselves. Um, the thematic reviews do encourage some coordination. UN agencies have to work together. Um, they could also encourage, um, could also be motivating in some ways because they highlight best practice countries that have done very well on certain SDGs, certain targets. Um, but otherwise, it isn't clear if coordination is enhanced through the SDGs, um, not in any obvious way, anyway. Epistemic role. So I do think the SDGs play a very uh, important epistemic role. Uh, some at the very extreme, you could argue that it's a language game. Uh, but now we all, everything we do, we're doing the same as we always did, uh, but we're using the language of the SDGs. So it's not actually changing what we're doing, but we're describing it as if we're uh, now making our efforts to achieve the SDGs, uh, even if we would have done those same things independently of the SDGs. Um, so that's why it's difficult to assess whether they're actually effective. It, you know, is it window dressing? Is it costly window dressing? Um, difficult to say. And in the worst case, it could actually lead us to, you know, in the best case, we're doing what we're gonna do anyway, Maybe they provide some additional motivation and coordination. In the worst case, it, it creates a space where we can only do things that are related to SDGs and not things that are left out. So lots of things that are related to development, economic, uh, economic development, political, uh, social, that aren't in the SDGs, right? Um, tax havens, one, children in prisons. Like there's so many different details that you could think of that are important, uh, but uh, that aren't a part of the SDGs. So in the worst case, we're all kind of forced to drop those issues and focus on the SDGs. Um, as I think academics and policymakers and scientists, um, there is this kind of push for us to uh, look for funding, and a lot of funding is tied to SDGs, so that also kind of motivates us to frame our efforts um, in the SDG language, basically. Uh, so finally, how to make the best of them. Uh, I'll think about, so we're I'm grouping us kind of into three groups, but there's probably a lot of intersections and maybe some other, some other um, identities as well, but academics, policymakers, and, and uh, scientists. So policymakers, um, 
don't get bogged down with the indicators unless they are relevant, um, right? So the in pursuing the indicators or pursuing success there isn't necessarily going to lead to the goals. Um, this was also, uh, Joseph Stiglitz was making this point as well uh, earlier this month in the UN, saying that you focus on the goals um, and then think about what strategies, think about strategies rather than concrete indicators, uh, what strategies are good to achieve the goal. Um, strategize, debate, consult about what makes the most sense in your context. It might be different from what makes sense somewhere else. And also, I think there is this uh, like sharing your country experience, which could be done in the HLPF, uh, about what worked in a specific context. Um, could be helpful. Uh, yeah, focusing on indicators won't necessarily lead to the goal. Uh, now, scientists. <laughs> and I know that you all know this, uh, but there's the political nature of any development intervention, right? Um, an intervention might be presented as technical and ap apolitical, but it's always political uh, as well. So um, having a think about uh, how your work might fit in a wider strategy to achieve the SDGs uh, and whether this strategy that you're a part of is realistic and, and if there's any way that you can ask questions or um, uh, influence the strategy. Um, academics, that's where I fit in, and uh, many of you. So, you know, do research that's meaningful on poverty, inequality, and technology, which are your research topics, um, regardless of whether it fits in with N SDGs. Of course, it's difficult because sometimes we have to be a part of some grant applications that are focused on the SDGs, especially in the UK. That's the case. I'm sure there's, that's the case a lot of other places, too. Um, so... To the degree that we can, we have to, you know, think about what's important rather than just what is important for the SDGs or, you know, yeah. So now um, we have, I think, about 10 minutes for discussion, 20 minutes. Um, so I'd love to hear any comments or questions that you have, especially now that we're, I'm sure that we, you all have very different perspectives on this issue. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a microphone. Okay, I'll be the coordinator of the discussion. I just briefly comments, not, not really for you to, because you don't have to answer, but just comments hearing from you. First, I think that the MDGs did raise the aspirations for the SDGs. So part of the complexity arises out of the development of MDGs despite the limitations. Second, I wonder how to deal with the contradictory criticism that have been raised. In, in third and last, I think it would, if it were possible to, 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 accommodate, to answer all the criticism, we would devise a wonderful uh, utopian ideal. But even the ideal, utopian ideals have a role. They do contribute to, to enhance the aspirations, uh, to in, also to promote social cohesion, even if we, we know we are never getting there, it's important to have utopian ideals. But that being said, I don't, I don't ask you to answer because those are just my wonderings, but I raise, I open the floor for discussions. You first, okay. okay. So, uh, thank you, thank you very much for your talk, uh, it's me, <laughs> and uh, you know, there are some global indicators that I wonder how they can be used in this context, of course, they, they have been used in other contexts, like for instance, you know, we are worried here about science and innovation, and there is this global innovation index, which, uh, which is an interesting in index to follow, in particular the dynamics of this index and to uh, understand what, why some countries go down in that index, others don't, so, and that's an indication of inequality as well. So uh, I don't know if that, 
Global Innovation Index, or there, is, there are other index, indices like that, has been used in this context. And of course, an important question is, is uh, uh, why <laughs> some countries go down, others go up, and to understand the mechanism behind that. I believe that's frequently connected to economic policy, actually, in these countries. But, so that's my question. Is that useful for assessing the SDGs? Uh, may I suggest that we collect three, and then we go for a second round? Well, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting uh, talk. Um, I think, however, that I would like to counter-argue um, mm -hmm. some of your, your arguments, because I think we can have a half full and a half empty uh, look at the SDGs. And I think yours is very much a half empty glass of it, in the sense that uh, I would like to support what Elisa says. I think that the SDGs put in the table uh, talks, arguments, concepts that would not have been there if the SDGs weren't there. And looking from the point of view of my area, which is gender and science, I think that putting in the table different arguments change the conversation. And changing the conversation, you will really achieve uh, some progress. And um, I also think that the um, discussion of indicators are very pertinent. But I think they are a step in the process. A step we are now, because several of these indicators weren't there. And I see also, when I look at gender and science, for example, how, pass, uh, how, how difficult it is to have significant indicators. But this is a step. The indicators are there so that we can understand the problem and devise political and uh, social policies to attack them. So I think that, um, um, I think that um, what I liked very much was your last slide on how to make use of the SDGs. Because there you, you show us how we can, um, well, use this in a more positive way than, let's say, the global, uh, um, um, uh, how do you say that, uh, administration uses them. So can you comment a little bit on these? How can you make good use of them a little more? I have three more people to answer. So let please be brief so that she has time to answer. Okay. okay. Good morning. I'm Paulo Speller. I'm, uh, I have been the Secretary General for the Organization of Ibero-American States all throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. And I think that a very useful mechanism which was established by UNESCO uh, with respect to SDG 4, quality education, it, was very u it is very useful because uh, we have all countries participating and uh, our organization was the real, the regional organization which was uh, uh, chosen to participate in this uh, forum, this council. And uh, we have the presence of every country in Latin America and the Caribbean. Of course, we had also the presence of uh, regional organizations. The UN was there, some European organizations. And uh, all throughout uh, uh, all the countries, we have been participating in the high-level uh, meeting in New York, etc. And I think that this, was a, this is a very useful because we have a, a direct impact on all countries. Of course, a differential impact uh, in different countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. But this is only for uh, SDG 4. So I'd like to, what other experience do we have with respect to other SDGs which, uh, or we don't have that might, we might have uh, with uh, different uh, international organizations, UN organizations that might, uh, because one of the problems is who would uh, uh, coordinate this uh, Initiative. English. So I'd like you to comment on that. English. Thank you. May I ask you to listen to three other very quick observations because otherwise people won't have a chance to talk. Yes, okay. great. I will be very quick and thank you for all your comments. This is great and I know that my talk was a little bit uh, provocative. Uh, I wanted it to be that way. Um, so um, 
I think um, I will just make a quick comment on uh, on, your, on the chair's um, comment about enhancing aspirations because I do think that it is good that we are you know talking about uh, global poverty and all these things, but uh, it's not like there weren't strong aspirations before the MDGs. There was a lot of organizing uh, in different UN um, organization or institutions uh, with uh, very strong aspirations that in a, in a large sense was lost with the MDGs. Um, so, you know, there were high aspirations without global goals. And then now, again, like, I think there is a very good um, shift towards the, with the SDGs of having, you know, higher aspirations again, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we do need global goals to have these, or the SDGs specifically to have these aspirations. Um, very interesting global innovation index, and I'm not familiar uh, with it in detail, um, but of course the innovation is very related to economic development. Um, I don't know how this is being... Uh, being, uh, if at all, uh, used in the, SDG, in the SDGs, but I will make a note of that. And um, yes, I know I have a half empty, uh, <laughs> well, this presentation was very half empty kind of uh, approach. Um, and it, it is good that SDGs put uh, new arguments on the, on the table, um, new aspirations, as you also mentioned. Um, indicators can help us understand the problem, but my point was more that the indicators can also limit our understanding of the problem. Um, so wh whereas we, yes, it's great that we're talking about inequality, environmental issues. Um, are the indicators as aspirational? I'm not so sure. What can you do? You know, um, try to improve them. In 2020, it's coming up again. The indicators are not, are misrepresenting the, the targets and the SDGs, which many claim they are. You know, there's, there's some work to be done. Um, and this, yeah, coordination is it's such an important issue um, for the SDG agenda, but I think that there isn't, um, uh, these kinds of opportunities aren't uh, coordinated within the SDG uh, agenda, right? So it's very good that they're happening independently of the, of the 2030 agenda, but I'm not sure if, I don't know specifically about the other uh, communities other than the SDG 4 but I'm sure that others here do, so maybe there could be some like learning, cross-participant learning here. Okay, thank you. 40 seconds interventions, please. Okay, 40. Uh, very quickly, thank you for your uh, very comprehensive uh, assessment of the SDGs up to now. My question is related to interdependency because this was, I think, a key dimension, uh, a key aspiration in the formulation of this agenda. We wanted an agenda for development that uh, could take a more systemic uh, look at the challenges and the opportunities that we have. This was, I think, a key pillar of uh, the uh, UN 2030 agenda even though we framed them as a vertical 17 objectives and goals, there was uh, behind the, the scene uh, a strong view on promoting more systemic, more transversal uh, view of development. You didn't talk much about it, uh, but I would like to hear your assessment on it. How uh, successful have we been in promoting this more integrated, systemic, transversal view of development. Example, water. Okay. We okay. need water for food, for energy, for uh, biodiversity. Please, can Are you we resume? being able to uh, reach this? Sorry to, uh, thank you. Madam, please, you have 40 seconds. Yeah. I shall not even give an example, but I want to ask very short questions. My name is Professor Atemo Michiaka from Nairobi, Kenya. Ingrid, thank you very much. Nice paper. One question, two short ones. SDG 17 is almost accomplished. Put there deliberately to do exchange in finances. In my country, 45 million people, everybody has got a cell phone, telephone using, poverty reduction. They can afford a credit or airtime into the phone, but not buy food. Is that actually helping? Absolutely not. Number two, I like to know my colleagues from China. You said two, three times, 
77 and China, and the meetings I used to be in UN, I used to see, of course, that 77 countries plus China. Maybe you can't answer now. But can I get some indication, really? And I asked this yesterday. Indeed, real, that the engagement, involvement, development, promotion of major capitals in various parts of African continent and even some South American ones, there is a reduction of poverty because of the engagement and the involvement of the Chinese government, particularly the Exim Bank. You may not answer that now, Ingrid, but maybe a thought, a discussion to advise because there are major issues emanating from the Chinese engagement and involvement in projects within the continent. So maybe my colleagues from China may wish to put some light. I thank you. Thank you. So the last comment. Ingrid, I think you've let academics off too easily. There's a lot more that we can do than structure our research differently. We, we teach future policy makers. We engage ultimately with the fundamental subversive act of thinking. And so perhaps could you come up with some other suggestions of what academics could in fact do that would contribute towards the SDGs? Thank you. I Thank think you. that's 40 seconds. Thank you. Okay. Final words? Okay, great. Um, thank you again, everyone. Um, and I think, yeah, some of these questions are directed to me, and I think some of them are directed to generally the conference uh, participants. Um, and I think some of them will come up again in the panel that's following, following this, uh, this session. Um, so the interdependency is really, um, really uh, important. And I think, I mean, it's in the 2030 agenda, it's key. Um, the connections between the goals, how the, well, whereas the MDGs were very vertical, the SDGs are not, they're supposed to be horizontal, we're supposed to think in an integrated manner. Um, and there is space for us to do that uh, with the SDGs, but the, if we focus too much on the indicators, that actually, uh, we lose that focus on the inter interdependence. So, I mean, the SDGs, we can allow ourselves to focus on the indicators, but we could also try to live up to the 2030 agenda, which I do think is very ambitious and good, um, which is the, you know, uh, basically a few pages ri written out um, uh, before the goals, where they talk about these interdependencies and leaving no one behind, all of this. Um, so I think that they have been, it's been successful in the way that, like, we have, uh, it has led to increased thinking about inter inter interdependencies, but there's, uh, there could be a lot more done, especially in the terms of how the indicators are framed. Um, well, the other question was about, well, I don't know if it was so much of a question, more of a comment, I think, throwing it also to our, uh, to our colleagues from China. Uh, role of China in development is very, uh, very important, but not really at all covered in the, covered in the SDGs. Um, and you raised the issue of, like, I th yeah, one of the indicators is cell phone per person. Some, I forget what it's meant to measure. Um, it's poverty or what it is. I don't think it's poverty. Um, but of course that isn't at all. I mean, and we see that in developing countries that people have uh, cell phones, access to credit, access to banking, but that doesn't mean that they're getting out of poverty. Poverty isn't because of the result of lack of access to phones and financial services. There are much more deeper structural reasons uh, that need to be tackled. So I think that you actually gave an example of some like narrowing, changing the meaning uh, type of indicator. Uh, and yes, academics, uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of things that, I, I do think academics play a very important role in educating uh, people uh, to become critical thinkers, uh, their knowledge of the world. Um, so I think I was focusing specifically on what we need to do in order to not get trapped by the, by the indicator framework or the SDG framework, but of course there's so many other things. And this is, I mean, academics in particular, but also the general public, to recognize inequalities that exist, to talk about them, to uh, teach different perspectives um, about development, what development means for different people in different contexts from different theories. Uh, yeah, I think that that's something that, a challenge that we have independently of the SDGs about how to make the world better. Yeah. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ingrid. Thank you to all of you. Okay, and now I call Youssef to coordinate the next section. Thank you very much, Eliza. And uh, before proceeding any further, I'd like to call on uh, Nova Ahmed from Bangladesh, Rodrigo Baggio from uh, Brazil, and John Jerling from South Africa to join me on the stage. Well, we have now reached the fourth session of the three extremely interesting sessions yesterday. We now move on to the fourth session, uh, which is entitled The Relevance of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, but the session itself is innovation as a tool for poverty and inequality reduction. In other words, we are going to look at SDGs 1 and 10, but to look at innovation as opposed to what we have been dealing with yesterday. When we talk about innovation, I think what comes to mind are new technologies, new development in ICTs, and there has been a lot of concern that these new technologies may even widen the gap between the poor and the rich and to extend the digital divide. However, it all depends what we do, what strategies, what policies we adopt, because it can have just the opposite effect. If we use new technologies in the proper way, in fact, we can get the poor people to leapfrog, uh, to use these new te technologies to leapfrog to the next stage of development. And uh, that's why it is very important to adopt the real, uh, the better strategies for development of the poor. The other thing I want to say is that we don't need only new technologies. Even old technologies can be used in a very innovative manner to improve the quality of life of the poor. I just give a brief example. For example, uh, we have uh, many rural areas which are not electrified and which are not even connected to the internet or to telephones. But we can use photovoltaic cells to have very sort of centralized uh, electrification of certain areas. Uh, so to look at all these aspects, we are very fortunate to have three experts from three different continents. Uh, we have Nova Ahmed, who is from uh, Bangladesh, John Jerling from South Africa, and Rodrigo Baggio from Brazil. And uh, so they are going to address this a very important issue and to see how innovative technologies can be used to improve the life of the poor, but also how to use all technologies in an innovative manner to improve the life of the uh, poor in rural areas especially. Rodrigo Baggio is president and founder of Record CDI International. 
a global NGO present in seven countries and 689 centers of digital empowerment. Uh, he's also the CEO and co-founder of uh, Trendel, uh, a global professional association of social entrepreneurs headquartered in San Francisco. So without going any further, I give the floor to Rodrigo for his presentation. Thank you. So good morning for all. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here in this important event. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm going to uh, talk in the next 15 to 20 minutes about our experience promote digital empowerment in Brazil and in Latin America. I started CDI and Recode 24 years ago, exactly, because uh, in this, the last week of March of 1995, we project a vision to using technology as a citizen right tool to, to change lives and to developing low-income communities. And I start exactly 24 years ago uh, in Rio de Janeiro implementing the very first digital empowerment center or technology and civic engagement education school in the most violent slum in Rio de Janeiro in that time, which was the Santa Marta slum in Botafogo, uh, Neguiburud in Rio. Co this slum was controlled by the Red Command, which is one of the three drug dealers uh, gang in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and uh, in, that, uh, in, that, uh, um, in that context, we start the first uh, technology uh, center in the slum in Brazil 24 years ago there. So, uh, and, uh, and what was important in that moment was we didn't have in that time another example to say, oh, uh, some organization in the south of Brazil or in the Brasilia created something like that and we would like to replicate. That was uh, the, the pioneer uh, initiative to promote digital inclusion in Brazil and connecting with the Catholic Church and a, a very special NGO in this community, we inaugurate on March of 1995 this center. And 300 young people immediately create a line, want to learn technology. And we invited the community leaders to be there to celebrate that inauguration. And I don't know uh, yet until now how, but 11 newspapers and seven TVs and three radios and two magazines was there to cover this uh, innovation in the social uh, uh, field. And immediately, uh, another 10 uh, community leaders uh, in 10 other slums in, in Rio uh, uh, invite us to replicate that initiative that, there in their slums. And in 1995, we start the first NGO in the field of digital inclusion in Latin America, CDI, the Center for Digital Inclusion. And uh, the, the important thing about our methodology, science in the beginning, is we, we never want to teach people, low-income people, only about technology. We always a project a vision to use a special methodology to empower people through the use of technology. One of my inspirations in that time was uh, in the Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire, which uh, 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 teaching people in Northeast region in Brazil how to read and write, talking about their problems, talking about their challenges. And we create our recode methodology, focus on that. So uh, we have four steps in our, uh, all of our courses, uh, in our methodology. And the first step is we, we train people, local people, to understand better their reality, to read the word, their word. So they're going to learn more about their reality. The second step is about we will invite our students in that class to create, to, uh, to find a challenge that they have passion about for. So they will find a problem or a challenge they want to dedicate time to try to solve. The third step is they are going to do a 
project use the technology they are learning to impact the problem they, that they choose. And the fourth step is go to action. It activates the entrepreneurial attitude. And we, the most efficient way to do that, this is just going to action and execute uh, and changing their proposal or their project in reality, and they are going to learn by doing. So, and also, we work with uh, four uh, social emotional uh, abilities, which is uh, creativity and innovation, uh, empathic communication, uh, solving problems, and work as a team. You know, so in all of our courses, we implement in these four uh, social emotional uh, abilities. But what happening when we start the first uh, uh, technology school in the slum in Brazil was we start this process to use technology to empower people. And now, 20 uh, uh, years uh, after the inauguration, we have, as uh, Professor Yuf said, uh, 689 centers for uh, digital empowerment in eight countries. So uh, I start this week in El Salvador, in the Central America, creating and inaugurate our first operation in El, Sal El Salvador. Uh, so we are in eight countries and we have been training 1.7 million people in technology and civic education in all of the Brazilian states and another seven countries. Uh, in this uh, process, we won uh, over 60 international awards. We become partner, par part of the four uh, most important social entrepreneurial organizations like Ashoka, Schwab Foundation, Skoll Foundation, uh, and Avina. Uh, and these awards, uh, like the CNN Award, Fortune, three awards from the World Economic Forum, etc., make us happy during one week, and then the life comes back again to normal, right? So, what makes us fulfilled? Inspiring young, poor people to become so, uh, change makers and using technology for that. And we have uh, 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 some uh, interesting uh, examples about uh, how we can empower digital, digitally low-income uh, young people. And I, I'm going to tell two or three uh, anecdotes about that. One is about uh, Wanderson. Wanderson. He, uh, at the age of five years old, with his family, four brothers and the mother, uh, live the south of Brazil, because the mother saw in the soap opera in Brazil about if they live in Rio de Janeiro, they will make more money and have a better life. So, they, as many people, so uh, uh, changing south of Brazil or northeast region of Brazil or north to become to the big urban centers like Rio and Sao Paulo, dreaming for a better life. But they move uh, and they start to live in the German complex which is a weird name uh, to refer a group of 13 slums in Rio de Janeiro. So the German complex is the name of this group of uh, slums. And uh, he lived and, uh, and, and raised in this community. At the age of 12 years old, he became part of the drug dealers gang, you know, because this is uh, the way where creativity people uh, uh, are inviting to express their entrepreneurial uh, work. He's working for drug dealers inside of their community. And he starts work uh, in the drug dealers gang at the age of 12. At the age of 15, he was in the jail for the first time. He lived the, jail, the prison, the, the jail, and he continues working in the drug dealers gang with more trust because uh, he uh, didn't uh, mention the name of people there in, the, in his drug dealers gang, and he starts to be a kind of COO and CFO of that drug dealers gang, which is responsible for all of the processes to receive the truck with marijuana and cocaine, and then multiply the profitability, distributing uh, uh, these drugs for different and several uh, uh, bocas de fumo, which is a small uh, uh, markets for sell these kind of drugs. So he uh, he had power, women's and money. He was a kind of prince in his Islam. He had bodyguards, and uh, and then he was in the jail again. 
in the prison again. And he, in this uh, prison, we had one of our digital empowerment centers. Our educator there, and for us, our educator is very important because our ed educators are our change makers. We do train the trainings. We have now over 1,200 educators working in our community centers or public schools or public libraries or community libraries. Where are the channels that we deliver our methodology? So our educator in that prison convinced Vanderson to uh, become educator because he had the ability for that. Not, he, he was fast uh, learning and he invited uh, Vanderson to teach technology for other uh, students in that prison. And Vanderson loved that and he became educator for digital empowerment in the prison. And when he leave the prison, he decided uh, change his life. And he was in his slum to negotiating his dropout for the drug dealers gang. And when he met the drug dealers, they call him professor because he was, he, 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 he was already a professor. And he left the drug dealer gang and he started to work in other digital empowerment centers. And until now, he uh, training di directly over 100,000 people, boys and girls, to become digital empowered in 20 Brazilian states. So Microsoft, one of our uh, sponsors, uh, saw in Vanderson a great example of a tech change maker. And Microsoft invited him to talk about his experience in the most important Microsoft conference for employees in Atlanta. For, and Vanderson, for the first time, leave Brazil and travel to Atlanta to talk for over 50,000 people about digital empowerment, about his example as a digital empowerment person. And then, when uh, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, uh, comes to Brazil four years ago, they invite Vanderson to share the stage with the Satya Nadella, the CEO of one of the most important or big corporations in the world, talking for businessmen in Sao Paulo about the power of technology to change lives. So Vanderson is a real change tech change maker. And uh, we have examples also in Amazon rainforest. Uh, we connect the internet and digital power over 30 uh, uh, vi indigenous villages in the Amazon rainforest. One of them was in Ashaninka uh, indigenous community, which is in the, uh, in the Acre state, seven kilometers from the border of Peru. Uh, to be there, we need to take a flight uh, uh, from Rio to Brasilia, Brasilia, Rio Branco, Acre, the capital of the state, and then a small flight to Marechal Taumaturgo, and then seven hours by boat to be in this village. So the biggest challenge for the Ashanik in that moment was drug dealers and wood dealers from Peru. They was coming and invade the indigenous territory to transport woods and drugs, and in that process, they start to kill indigenous men and rape indigenous women. And so the Ashaninka decided to start a war against the drug dealers from Peru. And in that war process, in the war board meeting, they start to analyze the situation. And most of the indigenous was very afraid because the drug dealers from Peru have reef or automatic uh, uh, guns. And the uh, Ashaninka had narrow and, uh, things and zarabatana, you know. But the shaman, had a very interesting idea. He talked with the, his uh, fellows, uh, indigenous, in this board meeting. We have a very powerful weapon. And every, which one? Which one? Internet. So they had the idea to send an email to the president of Brazil, just talking about we, Ashaninka, live in the border of Brazil, and we are Brazilians and indigenous, and the, the army is not here. So we are going to the war to protect and defend the sovereignty of Brazil. So this email start a movement, a campaign in Brazil. NGOs, environmental movement and leaders start to uh, uh, elevate that uh, call. And the email finally arrived in the president of Brazil. And he sent to the president, the, the person in army. And the army sent helicopters. And the helicopters start to the, the indigenous territory. And the drug dealers was afraid. They leave and the Ashaninka won the war. And they won the war because they use the internet to negotiate peace. So uh, we have several examples like that. 
but um, I think what is, 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 is more important is creating uh, this process that we can empower people uh, uh, through technology. And the challenges in Latin America or Brazil is, is still big. You know, in Latin America, 33% of Latin Americans have uh, uh, internet connection by smartphone. 33% only. In Brazil, we have 70% of homes, 70% of homes have internet connections. 94% of this internet connection comes from smartphones. And 95% of the use are only WhatsApp, uh, video on demand website, and one social media. So 95% of the use. So we are just in Brazil, in the first step of the digital inclusion, which is people have access, and, but they are using social media. They use things to uh, uh, entertainment and not to empower them. That this is the opportunity. And people in Brazil that here maybe uh, saw a, a wonderful research two days ago launched by Google and Brazil and McKinsey. What Google and McKinsey in Brazil realize is, of course, the, the level of the use of technology make people just using the basic, basic things. But if people was empowered and using more technology to jobs, opportunities, uh, learning process, that could increase until 2025, 70 billion dollars uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Brazilian GDP. Seven billion dollars in 2025 if people will be digital empowerment. And this is the reality in South Africa and Africa, in Bangladesh, you know, if people have qualitative access and if people using this technology empower themselves, they can change their lives, you know. So, we, we also have in Brazil an uh, interesting uh, opportunity to create awareness, uh, more awareness about digital empowerment through an invitation that we uh, received from the Global Network, which is by far the number one television in Brazil, to uh, promote the very first reality show with a cause in Brazilian television. So, and we, uh, so, and it was a really uh, interesting experience working as a showmaster of this show, where we show digital empowerment in four days in the low-income family, and they transmit in, 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 in the open television for fi five million people that was watching each episode. And for us, uh, this was also an innovative and creative way to create awareness about the importance of digital empowerment in Brazil. So, uh, we believe in the power of technology to change lives and developing communities. And if we use in technology as a digital empowerment tool, we can not only change lives in developing communities, but we can change our society in a society with more freedom and solidarity. We are in the, the early stage of the fourth industrial revolution. What we need to do is put our efforts to humanizing the fourth industrial revolution. All of our content, when we start 24 years ago, using PCXTs or 286 with DOS uh, and these, uh, uh, this kind of, of softwares, changed completely. Now what we are doing in our CVs and curriculums is we have a, 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 a web platform uh, that, that we are training people, and we believe in the hybrid model, in courses like Exponential Technology for Good, where we are training young poor people from slums uh, and, or, and prisons or public schools in, uh, in, uh, about artificial intelligence or, or augmenting, augmenting reality or Internet of Things uh, and about social, what is uh, be a social entrepreneur or an impact entrepreneur or a civic entrepreneur. We, we have special courses where we are training people on how to develop and prototype 
uh, application for a smartphone to do good. And they need to prototype and do a canvas, and then we can accelerate. So we, we have a, a partnership with Facebook in Brazil where we are training and we develop a special content that we are, we are training teachers and students from public schools in remote areas in Brazil about uh, VR360. And we invite them to produce a small video in VR360 talking about their reality and their problems. And uh, we are bringing innovation for remote areas in the, in the country. And, le and last oct October, UN um, uh, decide show uh, how these VR uh, movies could create an empathy or, or empower or engage people. And they did a selection for over 200 VR uh, short movies in the world and selects five and four of these five come from California, and just one come from the south of the world and come from our program in the Goiás state, in the central region in Brazil, where a group of five young students in the public school decide to, to talk and show about the life of a former garbage recycle that, uh, that after this uh, garbage place uh, was uh, interrupted, uh, she was the leader that mobilized over 400 families to try to go for another level of jobs and uh, professionalization. So Francisca is the name of this woman. And these, these boys and girls uh, show in VR 306 the life of Francisca. And this, uh, the life of Francisca, in 306 was in the UN General Assembly as an example about how VR could be the ultimate empathy machine, you know? So we need to create innovation to inspire uh, people uh, to be digital empowered. So, uh, yeah, so this is what we uh, did and uh, our strong belief in the necessity to work hard to implement in humanization the fourth industrial revolution and ethical uh, and values to finally uh, uh, cooperate with this uh, global uh, revolution in the, in the right way because the opportunity of humankind in the three, uh, uh, the three revolutions before was disconnecting with ethical and values. So this is where we are look, working now in this process to humanize the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo, for this very interesting talk. And uh, so we are talking about uh, digital empowerment, mainly. And we have now a young lady from Bangladesh who is also a computer scientist. And she's going to talk to us about the experience in Bangladesh. Well, as you know, Bangladesh has taken many innovative approaches, actions, like the Grameen Bank, which led to the award of the Nobel Prize to Mohammed Yunus. Uh, but um, that was not technology, but uh, an approach. So today we are going to hear on the experience of Bangladesh on maybe digital empowerment again, or connectivity. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I will talk about, uh, I will take a more on, more of an academic stand here. Um, you heard from a practitioner. So I'm, I'm a faculty of uh, teaching in Bangladesh. So I'm a computer scientist. I will uh, talk about the role of technology because we tend to think of it like a magic box that will solve the problems. But uh, what it is, uh, is it so or not? So, although I'm a technology person, but <laughs> maybe it's a PowerPoint, so, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, 
Okay. Uh, so first I wanted to talk about who I am. Uh, in the big picture, I'm just a small dot. Uh, I'm, uh, I did my PhD from Georgia Tech, USA. And when I finished my PhD, I thought I will come back to Bangladesh. And uh, like many others, I thought, yes, I know technology and I can solve all the problems. And here I am. So I was ready to jump. Uh, then uh, when I came back to Bangladesh, actually, uh, we, uh, if I show you, uh, if I introduce you to our, my beautiful country, you will see that, I mean, uh, it's a train. You probably you cannot see it well because it's covered with people. It's during a festive season. Everybody got on the train so that they can go back home during Eid vacation. So you can see people are all around. So it's a country with lots of people. It's a very densely populated country, a small country with lots of people. And um, it has, we actually experience lots of natural disaster on a regular basis. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit more about that. So um, if you look at this picture, probably here, it's very small. If you look at Bangladesh, on three sides of the country, we have Indian borders. So it's India. Inside of it, we have this little Bangladesh. And on one corner, we have Myanmar borders. So uh, strategically, it's in a very critical position uh, all the time. And we, we can see that the growth of people, I mean, we have 164.7 million people, and it's rising, but not the rate, growth rate has um, kind of stabilized. And per capita income has also increased. So it's, it's in the developmental process. The country, it's doing good uh, from what the government and all the papers are showing. But that's not the whole picture. Uh, it's a country where natural disaster is very common. We see uh, cyclones and floods on, I mean, regular basis. Floods happen every year, but large-scale floods take place all, all in alternate three or four years time frame. And um, we have lowland regions where flood is a big problem. But people adjust with that. So during monsoon season, they do fishing. During, when, when it's winter, they do farming. So people, people live with that problem. The other problem is cyclone. That also strikes us very hard. But in recent years, we have been able to actually minimize the number of casualties. But what happens is after these natural disasters take place, the people who experience it have to start from very, very low level. It's like they start empty-handed. So uh, that's um, what we have. So with a country with so, much, so many problems, and we have very limited natural resources, we want to look at the opportunities, that opportunity we talk about through technology. So first opportunity we see is our people, like we said before. So it's a country that has actually almost 50-50% gender division, 50.39 and 40.61% if we want to be very specific. And the best part is a majority of our population is youth driven. Now we have around 30% who are younger population. And by the year 2020, 2030, we are expecting youth to actually lead the country. And with that, we, we started with connectivity. So when we talk about technology coming into the picture, uh, um, Professor talked about um, uh, Professor Yunus. And what happened after we had this pro uh, first step of poverty elimination through small scale loans to general people, we had actually through Grameen Phone mainly, we had a uh, very good network throughout the country and uh, mobile phone usage. So even a normal person in the village will have a mobile phone and connect to everyone else. And initially when the idea was there, people were laughing at him. Like, who do you think a rickshaw wala will use, a rickshaw puller will use a mobile phone? What do you think he will do with it? 
but we actually didn't know what they could do with it because uh, when you have this connectivity, it reduces the middle people in between. So uh, even, even for general marketing, um, going to the doctor, very simple things became much easier through this connectivity. But still, this was mainly local connectivity within the country. So after that, so we can see a large number of actually people using uh, mobile phones. So it's, it's recent data. So then came actually the global perspective when we are thinking of the internet. So now it's actually, we have this local connectivity, we have these mobile phones, and when we have internet, it actually takes us one step farther. Uh, the number is low still, but I mean, it's promising that we, we have larger connectivity in the country. So uh, there are research papers that show us promises that uh, if we have this connectivity, if we have enough educated people, there will be, I mean, we can reduce this digital divide, that some people are digitally connected and some are not. So we can, we can take a better look at that. Uh, so, uh, when, we, when we have this connectivity, so we can look at what are the things this connectivity can be used for. So one major thing was a step ahead was uh, mobile banking. Using this mobile phones, I mean, and it's very simple interface. We, we just have one or two buttons. Even people who are not very literate, uh, they can use numbers, they can operate it. And this actually, within a very short time, we have 24 million users of this mobile banking. One particular is one from Brack Bank uh, that is called Bcash. So uh, we can seamlessly actually transfer money. Initially, it started within Bangladesh, and now we are connecting um, other countries uh, across the borders. But it's not actually uh, internationally available. It's in separate selected regions where we have Bangladeshi overseas, lots of Bangladeshi people. So um, this opened lots of doors because there are garments workers who have families in the village and they're working in the city area. They can send their money back to home. So we are removing the intermediary where money gets lost, trust things are based on trust so it, it opens up many doors for many of the workers who are working uh, being separated from the families the second second application was a healthcare application i want to talk about it has become very popular it's called maya appa maya means uh, compassion in bengali and appa means sister so it's it's actually using a very simple technology you uh, you make a mobile phone call to to a doctor and you can ask her any question it's not video call based mobile health or anything like that but the simplicity was actually the key of its success. So people would call, especially women, are, uh, women don't care much about their health. Even if they want to, they don't ask questions. They, uh, I mean, in Bangladesh, a sacrificing picture of women are always presented, that they have to sacrifice themselves, they have to do this and that. So when we had this Maya Appa, there was tremendous response. There would be calls about, um, general calls about children and then slowly it developed to women's health and um, it, it has become a, a great door uh, to, I mean, um, for many of the problems that nobody talked about. So, um, so after I give a general overview, I'm taking the privilege to talk about some of the projects I have been involved in. I will talk about three different projects that looks at three different aspects. And then we will go back to the question, um, how, how uh, technology is helping us or what's its role and how, what should be the role actually. So the first project, uh, it's still ongoing. It's about breast cancer awareness generation. In Bangladesh, um, 
Uh, apart from Western countries, breast cancer is a common problem, but it appears at much earlier stage. Uh, in early 20s, early 30s, you can have symptoms of breast cancer. So what we need to do is actually we have to have awareness among young people, not only at older age, you have to start screening and going, looking at symptoms from a very early age. But uh, this awareness generation process was actually uh, very difficult. We did not think it would be so difficult. When we started to talk to people, even in a female-only group, uh, they, they would feel uh, uncomfortable talking about a female body organ. Uh, some of them will bring out religious concerns that, no, I don't think it's, uh, it's right to do it. We may have, uh, it, it could be a sin. And then uh, there were all sorts of social cultural issues because in the household, it's mainly um, the male, male person of the house is taking care of the family. So if you have a health problem, you have to talk to that person. So uh, I wanted to tell you this story about one old lady. She, uh, she had some symptoms on her breast, but her son has to take her to the hospital. So she told him, I, she couldn't tell him that she has problems with her breast. She said, I'm having chest pain. And the son took him to a doctor. He did ECG, EEG, and all those things. And she, she felt very bad about it. Like, I, I cannot tell my daughters because daughters have to take care of their in-laws. So I have to tell my son. So not having the economic power, decision-making power actually makes the problem one level, I mean, it adds one layer of complexity to the existing status. So the second one actually is in a much better shape compared to the first one. So this is a, this is a low cost sensor we designed to handle flash flood in Bangladesh. So flash flood takes place in the lowland region in Bangladesh. Uh, it covers around 25% of the um, area where we uh, cultivate rice. It's, it's very low land, but when the, in monsoon season, when there's heavy rain, the, uh, the lowland actually covers up. The problem is a little bit political because we have India and three borders and the um, uh, rivers are coming from that region. So uh, what happens during the flash flood season, the water level rises rapidly. It's not a slow water level rise. So once it starts to rise, there, you have to move away. You have to save the cattle and things like that. People adjust to that re on regular basis, but they never know the starting time. So that's critical. So what currently people do is they have those long sticks and they measure the water level periodically, three times a day. So when they see that water level is rising, they uh, uh, start to alert people. Actually, they do azan on mosques. There are, all, I mean, leaders, uh, community leaders who take care of that. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to design those sticks the normal sticks, the water measurement sticks, with sensors. So it will continuously measure the water and it can generate alert. And we wanted to build it with very low cost so that we don't have to Im import anything, we don't have to build anything from foreign land. Everything is there, ready-made. We uh, faced strange problems. People in the locality were not happy with us solving the problem. It's our problem. Why would you come and solve my problem? It's, uh, let, we, we already have the solution. And later we figured out that people were scared because they're measuring water and they get paid by the government. So if we put a sensor, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not a good thing. More of that, sometimes they don't even measure the water level. They just send out random numbers. So if there is a sensor, I mean, there is a problem there. So uh, what we did is we involved them in the design process and they were actually part of the team that who were solving the problem. And it was actually, we got many insights that took us to a better avenue. And because I was leading the project, many other female students and researchers joined the team. That was actually a way to show empowerment, uh, gender empowerment. So when we went to the village, many others came, little girls came and they want, they helped us install the system and it, it gave us a different level of satisfaction on top of the solution itself. 
So it's, it's a work in progress. We installed in, in three different regions, but um, it's, it's giving us good results. There are actually commercial sensors, but they are very expensive. So our goal was to have something very low cost. And the third one is actually, uh, it, it was, we started it with, as a fun application because in families, we have photo albums and we keep photos of old days. Um, what if we could store the stories? Uh, we have family stories and I wish I could hear my grandma's stories in her voice. So we have all these digital artifact, but uh, what if we use it? We, we, test, we often say that, oh, now the technology is ma making us far apart. What if we use it to connect directly? So that's how it started, but uh, we, we got to use it in different situations. I will uh, say that in, uh, later. So these are the three projects I was involved in, I mean, uh, to connect and uh, do things directly, but uh, there were challenges. So it's not actually a problem that solves all the problems. Technology actually brings in new challenges because technology is designed having the Western people in mind. So when it comes to uh, a poor country or a not, um, not so developed country, we actually don't go through the developmental steps. We come directly to the implementation steps. We have it, but we are not trained through the transition process. So that brings in gaps. And if we are not aware of those gaps, it can take us to dangerous pathways. Uh, so uh, the uh, this work is actually we did in collaboration with Google. They studied, uh, they had a concern because in Southeast Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, they studied, there were, uh, enough technology usage, but not enough women using technology. So although we have a large, large number of users, only 25% of them are digitally connected. So we can see an inequality here. And when we, when we went over, we talked to, I mean, people, women, men, from different regions all across Bangladesh. Uh, I'm sharing the Bangladesh, Bangladesh study specifically here. We found out that women are not comfortable using technology because they consider it as a source of being abused because um, often they're not exposed to technology as the male counterpart of the family. Often the computer or the phone belongs to the boy of the family. And so uh, there is a gap in the learning curve. And often they think that, okay, uh, from Facebook, the profile picture gets stolen, the password is shared, and then there are other issues. So instead of uh, having the empowerment side, they're, they're, many of them are thinking it as a source of problem, source of being abused, so that, and a source of being harassed in many ways. Then uh, the storybook application we talked about, so during a student-driven movement, out of frustration, because there was a big protest um, after a school child was run over by a bus, and the minister was not doing anything about it. I mean, the minister said, it's just one person died. Why are you so worried? In India, 300 people died. And I mean, so people got very angry at that. And all the school children were actually on the road protesting about that. And during that time, the government shut down the internet because young, young students were using social media and all other medias. And we found out that actually, uh, this previously suppression was done in different ways, but now when we have this digital connectivity, suppression takes place through technology. You turn off, turn things off, and you think, okay, yeah, nobody can talk now. I'm 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 in, eff affecting the freedom of speech or freedom of expression, things like that. On top of that. Uh, what we found out that the policy we have to protect digital right is actually uh, very vague. It says that if it hurts someone's feelings, then um, you, you can get non-bailable jail. So you go to jail, you, ca you cannot be bailed out, you are there, but uh, if it hurts someone's feelings. And it turned out that it, every digital content only 
hurts the feelings of government people. I mean, ge for general people, I mean, uh, if, even if you try to apply that rule, it's, it, it's shown that no, there's not enough hard feelings, but if it's a government people, the feelings are very soft. So, I mean, the policies also have to come in place if we want to make the best use of technology. So, what we, what, uh, what I wanted to dis, uh, what I wanted to summarize from what we, what we have been talking about, um, technology can can play a great role. But uh, we have to have proper policies in place because it's coming here. We are not ready for this technology. It's, it's ready, ready to be used, but the policies are probably not as ready as it is, so we have to take a look at that. There has to be awareness about technology usage. Otherwise, it's like a knife. You can do good things and bad things with it. So uh, how, how it, we can get it? Ownership and responsibility about the usage is also another thing we want to dis I mean, we should be thinking about. So in conclusion, uh, I, I think um, it, it, it can lead to a better world, but there has to be awareness, policy changes, and support from uh, all type of people. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Nova. In fact, you have exceeded your time allocation, but I allow you to uh, carry on because of the very interesting presentation. So thank you once again. Uh, so now uh, we go to the last uh, presentation by John Jerling from South Africa. He's founder, well, he was founder of Connect Africa which is a social enterprise to extend GSM coverage to rural communication in Africa. But he was not very happy with uh, that only. So he moved on. Instead of connecting Africa, he wanted to connect the Earth. So now he has Connect Earth, and, uh, which uses internet to enable economic, social, and educational change. Well, you know, um, the internet is simply a tool. But when we want to look at poverty alleviation, we have to look at the causes of poverty, be it uh, health, uh, water and sanitation, uh, food production, or education. So maybe uh, we would like uh, to hear from you what internet can do uh, to tackle these problems which cause poverty. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eunice. I really appreciate that. Um, I was also very impressed with the, uh, the, the one of the earlier, um, the first uh, um, conversation that, uh, that took place. I, I just love the idea of a drug dealer becoming a Microsoft mate. I think that's a, that really does describe the power of, of, of uh, digital inclusion. Um, I'm also uh, very pleased to be able to, uh, to, to talk about this and to hear that utopian dreams are, uh, are, are important as well because what I'm going to present today is very much a utopian dream, but uh, I think we could actually make us real. So um, I'm going to put a challenge to everybody at the end of my presentation and see where we go. So um, Eunice touched on the, on, on the brief, really, in that uh, two-thirds of the world's population are going to be living in urban areas by 2050, and we're going to need to look at new inf infrastructure, new innovations that are going to need to take place. Um, we're looking at whole new industries, transport, uh, telecommunications, sanitation, health, agriculture, housing. There's all sorts of wonderful things that are going on out there, and we're watching it move exponentially. We're also looking at new um, social needs around the world. Um, the hashtag MeToo movement has changed things quite dramatically. People are, are thinking differently. So um, I'd like to add in this new um, innovation that we need to do called new thinking. And uh, of course, part of that is bridging, bridging the digital divide in countries where there is currently digital exclusion. So, um, uh, Eunice did touch on, on, on sort of why I'm here. Um, 
I've had 23 years in, uh, in, in the digital environment. Uh, I started off in advertising in the UK in the middle of the dot-com boom. Sadly, didn't make much money out of that, but it was great fun. Um, and then I moved back into, in, back, uh, into Africa, and uh, 17, the last 17 years or so I've been working in um, digital access, um, beginning with the GSM, uh, pushing GSM into, into rural areas. Um, Eunice did say that I wasn't very happy with that. Well, not, 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 not entirely true. It, 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 we're finally seeing the results of that happening now. 2G is starting to push out into, into rural areas, and the mobile networks have finally woken up to the fact that there are people um, out there, and it is a market. It might be a poor market, but it is a market. My problem, however, is it's 2G. Um, the world is moving on. It's, uh, it, we're looking at 3, 4G, and there's five, you know, all the talk now is about 5G. So it's all about data, and 2G doesn't really allow for that. Um, so we've moved on, but uh, these, these, these countries that are suffering poverty are not. So I wanted to address that, and that's when two of my colleagues and myself set up Connect Earth, and, uh, and we're now looking at providing free and open access to the internet. We use ad an advertising model, we use um, sponsorship, we use data analysis, we use content distribution, and various monetizing means to, to actually pay for that infrastructure. Now, the, 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 the gist of my uh, presentation is that I believe Africa holds the answer to not just the reduction, but the eradication of poverty and, and inequality. Um, and, the, and that answer is actually Africa's youth. Africa's sitting, and we'll go through some numbers shortly, about um, with the biggest, youngest population in the world. But unless these youngsters are, and uh, I was searching for another word for, for educated, and uh, one of my uh, compatriots from South Africa suggested knowledge. And uh, I think that's a, that, that, that's a far better word. And we need to look at innovation in access to knowledge in order to make um, the African solution work. So what's the kind of in, in innovation that we're going to need? Um, the innovation, as you saw on the front, on the first, the first sort of uh, slide, is innovation is, is defined as changing something that's already established. And we can have tangible change and intangible change. The tangible stuff, well, it's the technologies that, that, that we're seeing change in front of our eyes. The intangible ones are how we think. Um, and that, that, that's going to take some radical thinking. That's the utopian side, is how are we going to think, change the way in which we think about uh, digital inclusion and education or access to knowledge. We, we need both those tangible and intangible changes urgently, and we need them now. The SDG, uh, SDGs are, um, uh, you, th this, is a, this is a slide on how the mobile technologies have affected the SDGs. Um, in the last sort of three years, well, since 2015, you'll see the gray areas 2015, blue 2016, red 2017. So there was a massive change. The, 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 in, the influx of mobile technology and access to, to um, uh, uh, um, uh, the digital age had a, had a huge impact uh, in 2015, but it's gradually slowing. So this is why we need this new thinking. Oh, God, I've done the same as everyone else. Right. So how is, how is, how is this innova innovation going to help? It means that we need to think about how science and technology is going to be um, uh, innovated uh, and how we use the tools that already exist and make them more effective. How we, if we look at what people are using it for in the developed world, it's YouTube, it's, uh, it's games, TED Talks, all the, all the lectures that um, the academics here have got on their computers. Uh, all this information, this knowledge is available, um, but it's how we use that, and we need to think differently on how we're going to use that. We then need to be able to provide the access to that knowledge base. So how are we going to provide people um, who don't have access currently to that knowledge base? Um, if they have it, that's going to bring prosperity. And in my view, prosperity is the most powerful weapon against poverty and inequality. So science and technology is the fundamental foundation on which um, we build this, the, the, the infrastructure that's going to, to make this happen. And the infrastructure consists of the content and the tools. So that's all the lectures, it's all the information that's available out there, and, it, and it's everything. It's, a, it's an ocean of information. Um, and next to that sits access. How do people actually access that? If you've got those two elements, we then need to change the way in which we think about how we actually use them. 
what, what, how, are, how are people who currently don't have access to that going to access it? And how do we, who do have access to that, going to uh, provide that, 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 that information in a structured format, in a, in a safe environment, in a, in a way in which um, people who don't have access to learning or knowledge currently are able to use it really effectively? And then there's a little outlier, not so little. It's actually the worldview. We have to change the worldview on how this information is used. At the moment, um, people are, are, are using it in a social environment, and in the developed world, you've got a very structured curriculum, you've got very structured learning processes. Um, in the undeveloped world, uh, the, the, the learning process, the education curriculums are way behind. These, they, they, they are never going to catch up, they are never going to change in time for the SDG 1 to reach its goal by 2030. So why is Africa the answer? We've got the biggest, youngest population on Earth, and is that an asset or is it a liability? It's a question that we, we, we're going to need to ask ourselves. Overall, poverty reduction has, has already been a success. We've seen it, we've seen it work quite effectively. Um, I think you can see the SDGs are, are, are sort of kind of meeting their, their, their goals already. We're, we're looking at extreme poverty is less than 8%, but not in Africa. It's, uh, it, it's actually become worse. And the, the following slide is, I, I, I'd please say the one depressing slide. There's only one depressing slide in my slide, in my, in my presentation, but there we go. But um, sadly, by uh, the end of last year, 3.2 million more people were living in poverty than before. So it's gone the reverse of everywhere else, reverse of China, the reverse of India. Um, it's, it's, it's actually quite scary. And by 2030, 90% of people living in poverty are going to be living in Africa. Um, you know, we need to fix this. So this slide I put in because it is actually quite interesting to see how India, Bangladesh, Indonesia have dropped out of the, the, the top 10. They, they were in the top 10 um, uh, poorest countries in the world last year. Um, and uh, by 2030, uh, all, there, nine of them are African. Uh, interesting to see it's Venezuela that's popped in there. That was a, a, a little unexpected, I have to say. But uh, the really scary number is, look at Nigeria, 111 million people. That's up, up from 90 million in 2018. You know, we should be going backwards, uh, forwards, not backwards. So, um, you know, that, 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 that just sort of gives you an indication as to just how bad the problem is. We're sitting with a major, major issue in Africa. It's a catastrophe waiting to happen. But there is an answer. There are a lot of young people there. 33% of the world's young are going to be living in Africa by 2050. That's half a billion people, just about, 437 million. By 2000, half of the, of the global youth, that's kids between 15 and 24, are going to be living in Africa. Now, when you've got that number of young people in one place, now, and Africa is not one place, it's 54 different places, and they are very, very different. But the point is, is that it's one continent, um, and they are reachable. But currently, they don't have access to the kinds of, of advantages and kinds of uh, information and knowledge that we sitting in this room have, have access to. There's also another problem. The world is getting older. That the light green is less than 10% of people that are over 65 are going to be living in Africa by 2050. Less than 10% are over 65. All the blues, the dark blues, are upwards of 35, between, between 25 and 35%. So the world has got itself an economic crisis coming as well. 2050, it's, it's, it's envisaged that there's going to be a $400 trillion pension savings shortfall. $400 trillion. A hundred trillion is the global, under a hundred trillion, 87 trillion is the global GDP right now. 400 trillion in just pension savings shortfall is frightening. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's global bankruptcy. How do you address that when the, uh, the population is all old? They're, they're, no, they're not paying for those pensions anymore, they're using them. But you've got half a billion youngsters who could make a difference. So it's in the world's interest to start looking at Africa now and to sort of say, well, hang on a second, these are our future. These guys are our future. They are going to pay our pensions. They are going to be our employees. They are going to be working with us. And they are essentially going to keep us alive. So there is a very, very compelling argument 
to, um, to, 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 for the world to change its view, new thinking on Africa. Africa is an opportunity. It's not the disaster that everybody is seeing it, it is at the moment. If you look at the, 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 the growth, I, I just put this one in to compare the, 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 the growth in numbers of youth in, in Africa. It's an exponential growth compared to the rest of the world. And in fact, in some of the, the, the developed nations, it's actually going downwards. So um, again, it just reinforces this, this, this asset that, uh, that Africa is sitting with, but is completely underutilized right now. So, if we can fix Africa, we can fix the world. It's the biggest opportunity. It's that growth center I was talking about. It's the home of innovation. Uh, there's a lot of talk about M-Pesa. Everyone knows M-Pesa, the mobile money transfer thing. That, and Safaricom took credit. Well, they, they, they productized it. So, so they, they were very clever in that. But that was developed by uh, individuals buying airtime, transferring it to their friends in another city, who then sell it on and take the money. Very simple way of, of, of a transaction. All the mobile operator did was simply monetize it um, or uh, productize it. Um, SIM cards, prepaid SIM cards. No one had credit records. You couldn't get a contract on your SIM, on your, on your mobile phone. So they had to come up with another way in which they could give people SIM cards. That innovation out of Africa. Um, I like to put Nollywood in there because, uh, you know, there the, are the more movies made in Nigeria. Um, for $500, you can have a 12-series uh, soap opera. It's, a, it, it's amazing. So, um, and, I, and I believe that's innovation. Filming it all with their cell phones, it's terrific. Um, that biggest, youngest population, they're young, they're ambitious. They're no different to anyone else. A child is born is in, in anywhere in the world. is precisely the same. The moment they take their first breath, that's when they're influenced. It's the environment that they're in. It's, uh, it's, it, it's how they grow up. It's the nutrition that they've, that, that they've had, both as, as, as a fetus and um, as the infant. So nutrition and health, obviously, the two key factors to start with. But after that, it's the access to information. It's the access to knowledge that's going to make the big difference. Um, the, the, the old guard of Africa, which is the one that's actually holding everything back, these are the, 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 the big men, as they call them. These guys are all going to be gone in 10 years' time. So we needn't worry about them too much. We need to start thinking, doing this innovative thinking now so that we're ready for when these guys have all gone. There are enough innovative leaders that are starting to come to the fore in Africa right now. Ghana, uh, even Nigeria is, is, is really working hard to change their side. Um, Tanzania's changed. Uh, Ethiopia, the rock star president. You know, there, there are some people there that are really starting to think differently. So we've got, a, we've got a, uh, an environment in which we can start this work now. We've got 10 years to get rid of these old guys um, and have something ready to go. Because after that, it's only 20 years before you're sitting with your SDG 1 goals that need to be met. And then there's only 30 years in total before you're sitting with, uh, with, with, with half a billion youngsters who are going to need to be paying your pensions. So... The other thing that's also useful is African solutions are replicable. You know, if you can solve a problem in Africa, it, 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 it can be done, it can be used elsewhere in the world. It doesn't work the other way around necessarily. You know, we were talking about the Grameen Bank model um, that worked very well in India and, and uh, in Bangladesh and, and, and also to some degree in India, but it didn't work very well in Africa. Different culture, different mentality. But what works in Africa generally does tend to work elsewhere, so that innovation can be transported out. And then the incentive is there. As I say, you know, the world's, it's in the world's interest to start investing in Africa. So what's stopping us? Well, out of 4 billion people that are, that are currently not connected to the Internet, they're covered, but they don't have access to it for various reasons. They either can't afford it or they don't have access to the devices. Um, 1 billion of those are in Africa. So, you know, that's a huge percentage of people that are not connected. And there's not enough devices. Um, currently, you know, subscriber penetration is only at 45% in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and smartphone adoption is, is under 40%. Um, you know, and you, you can just see the statistics there. They, they are much lower than the, the, than the rest of the world. So that's what we want to address. That's our utopian vision. If we can change that, then, uh, then things are going to be different. So what do we have to fix? It's that, it's that, it's that access. They don't have it right now, they can't get it. So how do we do that? Well, the data and the access to it needs to be free. So we're going to have to find different business models, different cases that, 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 that are going to make access to the Internet sustainable. Um, and that's what, that's what we do, essentially. Someone has to pay. No, nothing is free. So we just need to find clever ways in which you make it free. 
And, you know, there's, a, there's an argument to say that, that the, all communications, actually, digital communication, should be free. You know, all of us, we pay our, our monthly fees, we pay our, our prepaid calls. Um, we're paying for advertisers and salespeople to reach us. They should be paying us to reach us. So there's, a, a, again, some new thinking involved there. They, we, we need to rethink that whole process. Everyone needs to have smartphones. Now, there's, there's clever ways to do that. Um, Orange has just launched the first $20 smartphone. That's a game changer. So, and that's in 17 countries, or, uh, Middle East and Africa primarily. So you know, that really is going to make a difference as it, as it sort of rolls out towards the middle of this year. Um, and the traditional education of, uh, of, 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 of uh, African students at the moment is, is diabolical. These kids don't stand a chance. That needs to change. And we need to come up with another system that's going to run in parallel to the existing education system. You're not, you're not going to be able to change it, but you can work with it and you can allow the kids to, to develop it themselves because ultimately they're going to have to teach themselves. And we need to change the world's perception of African youth. Like, like that picture, old, the old world. Africa is an opportunity, it's not a liability. And we then also, this is all going to cost money, so we do need to convince the rest of the world to invest in Africa for its own good. So where do we start? That's changing the thinking. And this is where the academics come in, and that's why I'm really pleased to be here, because you guys actually have probably the most important role. Because in that strategic, that critical, that new thinking, that innovative thinking, we're going to have to rethink the whole way in which people learn, in, in, in which people are provided with access to knowledge, and what they do with that knowledge, and how they process that knowledge. So that's going to be absolutely key. And we're going to have to focus on the three to eight-year-olds. Because the, anybody who is over 15, sadly, in Africa right now, uh, is going to have a really tough time of it. So, you know, the three-year-olds have, have got to be caught now. Um, they are going to be the parents of those youth in 2050. And if we don't catch them and be able to change the way in which they perceive themselves and how the rest of the world perceives them, we're going to lose them. And then they need to be able, if we, we, so we've provided the information, we've provided the knowledge, we've provided the access, they need to be able to, to navigate that access and process it safely. That's another huge challenge, and I, I, again, I come back to utopian, but we're going to need to, we, we have to address it, we don't have any choice, and we're going to have to make the rest of the world pay for it, so um, that's going to be interesting too. So the challenge to academia that I, I said I wanted to put forward is that because Africa's education systems and its, its, its existing uh, uh, structures are not going to innovate fast enough for this, this half a billion youth that's going to be in 2050, they, we're going to have to come up with a new way that, for them to teach themselves. So have access to, to, to learning. It was shown, with a, with a, again, with the first talk, what is possible if you empower uh, young, youngsters and individuals, uh, even in deprived areas, to learn. They can do it. If we can solve um, that, that education side, we solve the poverty conundrum as well. Because as soon as you, you enable people to prosper, they are going to pull themselves out of this poverty gap, which, uh, which, which, is, which is really what the SDGs is all about. And, uh, and, and by proving that, that, uh, that, that, that we can make that difference, um, the real fun thing is that the kids are going to do it anyway. You, if, uh, any of you, if you ask your kids where did they learn the stuff that they really enjoy doing, they'll probably tell you YouTube. It was all done on YouTube. It wasn't in the classroom. So these kids are going to teach themselves anyway. Let's just structure it so that we can, we can facilitate that. Most of it, they're going to be on Facebook, they're going to be WhatsApp, they're going to be, all, they're going to be trying all sorts of things. But they still have to do their homework. They're still going to have to access the internet properly at some point. And if we've got that environment, a safe environment whereby which they can do that. And I'm talking about desks sitting on, uh, uh, behind a garage forecourt, shell for example, if we want to work with um, shell garages across Africa, we can put a small classroom on the back where the kids come after school. You don't, you don't try and change the school curriculum. You don't try and change the government structure. That's not going to work. We're going to have to do it in parallel to what it is right now. And then gradually, as the kids start, start basically teaching themselves, um, we will hopefully have started a movement where 
the benefits of that become manifest. And we work with the leaders. We work with the leaders that are, that are forward-thinking, that are, 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 are trying to change things already, and we empower it. We get, the, we get the, the, the Western world, we get academia, the 107 institutions. Imagine if we could pull all those 107 institutions together, these, these academic institutions, the brightest minds in the world, all to do that, change this perception of Africa, bring people in, um, create an environment whereby that knowledge base, that knowledge uh, library is there, um, we can provide the access, we can bring the advertisers in, we can bring the money in to pay for it all, um, and, and we can bring in the cell phone companies, Orange can give us all the phones, we can make that happen. It's what's there, let's make it, and let's, uh, let, let's, let's be able to show them. So I have set up some next steps, but, but basically we can go through these if anyone's interested in, doing this, in actually doing this. Uh, we can do it. Let's, let's have a call to action. Let's get these 107 academic institutions together. Let's form a working party. Let's prove the concept. Let's pull, let's pull it together. There are a whole bunch of projects we can tap into in Africa. We could even use the experience in, in, in South America um, that, that, that's already been here. Maybe even, even uh, uh, work, on, work together on that one and then take it into Africa and see how it works. We can pitch the funders. Let's implement it. And Let's get it going because we need to start right now. You know, these, these three-year-olds um, need to be caught and uh, they'll be paying our, our pension savings in, in 2050. So there's our future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dion. And uh, so we have seen the perspectives, I mean, the, the approaches, rather, in three different uh, continents, I must say. And the uh, question arises whether we should look at these sort of uh, cultural differences also when we uh, consider solutions to the problem of poverty. Uh, so what uh, we are running a little bit behind time, so I will ask the indulgence of Marcos and Eliza to extend by 10 minutes, if that's possible, so we can sort of uh, take uh, some more questions. So we'll have three questions from the floor, and then uh, we are going to respond, and then three more questions. So let's start with... Um, Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a fascinating uh, presentation. One of the key cross-cutting theme uh, which all the three presenters talked about was connectivity. That, uh, that if there is connectivity, if there is internet, then things will move ahead. Now, coming back to the discussion which we had yesterday about the impact of education and poverty, uh, don't you think that, you know, we need to go beyond this whole issue of connectivity? Uh, giving you an example, there are now <coughs> programs which are self-learning. And for a child who is preschool or who is in the school, it is not connectivity, it is the digital device which has preloaded programs into it where the child can self-learn. So to, to me, I think, uh, because internet connectivity, there's a lot of investments going in, it's not going to cost, it's going to maybe take another 10 years for everybody to get it. But this, these devices are now available. And I think at the policy level, countries should seriously look at providing in the school bag a kind of a digital device which is not connected, but it has preloaded programs which are self-learning where the child can start learning himself. And in fact, that can change a lot of things. It can change the investments which is made in education. For example, yesterday we were talking that Brazil made X number of investment, amount of investments, but when it came to learning outcomes, they could not see the results. Uh, we have done this experiment and I'll, I'm going to talk about it tomorrow, but uh, we have seen tremendous results, particularly in preschool children, the children from two and a half years to like four years. 
So any any comments on that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question. Yes, well, thank you very much. I thought the session was really exceptional because it brings some issues about technology, which I think um, academics and scientists must think of. I was especially um, touched by the um, Bangladeshi example. I think that very clearly when you don't have a technology that is empowered by the people that will use them, unattended consequences will come, and sometimes bad ones. The, the example of the measuring rods, where very clearly people didn't understand their power in the community, and when you try to change that, it was only when you realized what these measuring rods were really uh, um, um, meant uh, for the community where you were able to do it. So I think that this is a very important lesson to learn. How technology cannot be given, it has to be um, embraced by the people who use it, otherwise it doesn't. And I was also fascinated by your example or your thought about how to change knowledge. And I think this is really the issue when you think of how science and technology will be used to, uh, to reach the SDGs. Um, it is not fixing the people, it is fixing how you think. And to do that, I think that what this um, discussion brings is that you need diversity and you need to look at the way people think uh, using many actors and not just uh, uh, the scientists and the academics. And th this, I think, is our major challenge for the future. Um, also, the idea of reaching three-year-olds, I think this is fascinating. Because if you have um, um, children around you, you will realize that one and a half year old children look at the cell phone and use their fingers to change the image. Come on, this is something in the brain is, is, is different. So how to use that positively? I think it's also a great, uh, and finally the Brazilian example is fascinating. So if you could comment a little bit on these things, I would be. Thank you. One more question before the panel will respond. All right, thank you for the largely positive views, which is much needed amidst a growing concentration, as you rightly point out, of poverty reduction in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, also on this point though, Largely, um, some of the presentations assume quite an optimistic trend of the old thinkers, the old leaders being effectively um, leaving because of age and so on, and the new coming in with new and improved work on poverty reduction. The reality, though, I fear is perhaps a bit more somber in that the reality might be played by continued elite interests, continued elite capture, as well increasingly authoritarian tendencies in certain countries which limit free speech, limit even what research can be made public, what academics and others can say, um, young, both young and old, um, in these countries, in Tanzania, in Rwanda, and various other countries also of Sub-Saharan Africa. So in principle then, you can have all the science and te technology in the world, but if the political culture doesn't necessarily allow it to be employed, you're rather stuck in terms of what can be done for poverty reduction. So my question is this. In this context, amidst re potentially restrictive political economies, how do you propose that technologies continue to be harnessed to contribute to poverty reduction in these contexts? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so before we move on with other questions, uh, who would like to kick off? Uh, yeah, some, 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 great, some great questions there, actually. Um, 
And uh, you know the the the, the question on on, um, on on devices and uh, connectivity. Well, you know the very fact that you have a device that's been uploaded with 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 content on it um, means it is connected. The, the the fact that it's not necessarily connected live to 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 the internet and such is uh, is really moot. I think. Um, uh, you know, you're not going to connect a three-year-old or a, or a preschooler to directly to the internet. That would be looking for trouble. We need to be a little bit more, a little bit more um, uh, uh, circumspect about that. So, so the, the connectivity element is really just being able to distribute that knowledge. Um, and, and really key. The devices, there are some fantastic devices out there, lots of uh, educational programs uh, in Africa as well that, they, that, they, that they're doing. The sustainability of it is always the, is always the problem, so there's, some, there's some, uh, some, some clear thinking that we need to do on that. Um, the, 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 the diversity, um, you know, uh, the, the, the tech sort of design and, and, and having diversity in, in, uh, in the decision-making process, absolutely crucial. And, uh, you know, having 107 institu academic institutions here does give you quite a nice sort of diverse uh, grouping. But we need to bring in business. We need to bring the kids in themselves, you know, because they're going to do this whether we like it or not. So we may as well try and, try and bring them in and, uh, and, and let them show us the way forward because they can show us amazing things. And then, um, you know, uh, the, the, the elite and how, and how is that, uh, you know, who, who tend to capture everything. Um, uh, yes, uh, and, and you know, we're stuck with that problem in so many countries in Africa. We go around them. You know, it's going to happen anyway, and if they really do block it, you, 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 you leave them. You, you, you find somebody, you find the path of least resistance and go that way. Uh, and eventually they'll be surrounded, and eventually it'll become untenable. Uh, and eventually it will change. But in the meanwhile, you'll have changed a whole lot. You don't stop. You don't let that stop you. Thank you. Uh, please. Uh -huh. I, uh, let me try with uh, the opposite order. So I talk uh, to you about uh, what happens if the elite hold all, all these elements. I mean, um, we, we have, uh, like uh, our previous speaker said, we have moved beyond that. Technology is making differences, even though there are boundaries, even though there are uh, uh, thoughts that are holding back, there are um, separations of knowledges, but things are moving on. You have seen the Arab Spring, how things have mo moved, even though there were other, other pressures ongoing. So there will be, I mean, it, it's a fluid, knowledge is a fluid thing. So we always think it will find a way like uh, we, we have seen. How and when, we cannot dictate it from here, but it will happen naturally. That's, that's, my, um, that's from what we have seen so far. And about, about the diversity, I, I totally agree with you. And with that diversity, I think we can, I mean, um, actually address many of the challenges. Uh, about connectivity and device, that's one thing. Uh, I mean, one laptop per child actually died even though it had many promises that every every kid will have their personalized laptop uh, so we have to because uh, when uh, when knowledge is in inside enclosed enclosed in a box it can become stale we have to have windows and doors open so that it can grow that's uh, i mean for preschoolers it's okay but when we are growing because through exchange, through practice, pr through sharing of information, like we, even if we agree or disagree, w when we have that conversation open, it will only, we will have different visions, diversity, and other ways of going, moving forward. So uh, I, I, with that, I, I think we should have windows open so that it's not only enclosed in a box. It can be content distribution for younger ones, but even the younger ones get bored of the same content over and over. So yes, thank you very much. Well, would you like to add? Yeah, just uh, adding for the first question about connectivity. So I'm less worried about the connectivity because that the market is very worried about. So Facebook, Google, Google, Amazon, and all of these big companies are looking for the next billion of uh, internet users. But for me, the question is, uh, uh, how do we can inspire the next billion of change makers using internet to, to impact our society? So, uh, and for that reason about, we start talking about digital empowerment. Empower someone is help someone seek for their own autonomy or freedom. 
And that's the movement that starts within ourselves to, our, our, uh, to outside. So uh, uh, the, the question for me is how do we can empower people to use that technology to do positive things in the society? So. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let's have uh, three more questions, but can you keep your questions very short and precise so that we can have some time to respond? Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Ismail, I think, first. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I would like to thank you. Yesterday I, I asked for action and you give me today. And I, I would... I, I love this panel because you gave inspiration for us to think about and to go on. And I would suggest you to, to go on the Israel education because in 2001 I was in a project that uh, there is a, a teacher from Israel that talk about education in Israel and they are already in front of in this point you have put out. And I would like to thank you very much because I think this way you is the way that the the, the knowledge is 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 kept through the process, not before the process, not after the process only but through the process, and you made a project on that. And I would ask you if you have some reflection on the way you do the things. That's a specific question for you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I also found this panel very inspiring, but in fact, perhaps too inspiring. Uh, from a uh, purely scientific point of view, there are enormous negatives that are being studied right now as a result of connectivity. I don't have to tell you about social media. I don't have to tell you about the impact that it's having on depressing children and even committing suicide from uh, bullying to other techniques. I don't have to tell you also about the enormous variability. If you take a country like the United States, practically everybody is connected, but nevertheless, there's enormous variability. So the technology itself is not the absolute answer. And uh, I regret that we didn't have any of the counter arguments about what's going wrong. In fact, it's quite stunning that children do not, do not learn faster by handling tablets than through conventional books. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of studies being done today that underline this point. So, yes, technology is needed and technology enables us to do things that we couldn't do before but it's also enabling a lot of negatives in society, and it's also enabling, if I may remind you, the recruitment by terrorists of young people. And we have just seen thousands who are now sitting there from Europe who were recruited in Syria and whom nobody wants to take back. And that's one of the big problems that we have today. So from the examples I have given, of course, they're wonderful examples. The question perhaps, from me would be, what is it that would make some cases work positively and yet allow the same technology to be deployed in a way by other people in society uh, that uh, leads to negatives? We've had this dual use problem from the time we discovered fire or the first kitchen knife it can be used positively and negatively. But in fact, I fear that the evidence of the limited impact of uh, technology on, say, education and formation uh, has not been sufficiently countered. And what I'd like to draw out from you is what is it that makes your examples work positively while we have this mounting evidence of scientific studies that shows that, on the whole, it is not making that big a difference in education. Thank you. One last question. Thank you. Uh, I was very pleased with the actual action experiences that we have seen now. And I fully agree with uh, Professor Ismail on what you have just said. But we have some uh, urgent or even emergent situations. May I remind you of what we are living in Brazil now and in other Latin American countries 
where we are receiving uh, Venezuelan refugees. For instance, in Roraima, in northern Brazil, we have a situation which is absolutely emergent. And uh, I have not heard any mention, maybe I have missed uh, it, but no one has referred to the refugees everywhere, uh, in Syria, in Latin America, in Central America, etc., etc. Uh, I was very impressed with the experiences of CDI, uh, Rodrigo. Uh, you are Brazilian, I assume. <laughs> uh, what would you suggest us in real and uh, practical terms? I'm asking it because I'm about to be involved in a project uh, with uh, women and young women in, in uh, Roraima. Uh, what can we do, actually? What technology can bring us in, especially from your experience. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Uh, maybe we start with you, last question first. Please. So, um, my reflection about refugee, etc., cetera, is, um, uh, it's about, so we, we were, one of our channels is, uh, is working for Empower Libraries public libraries. And in fact, one of our, li we have now over 200 libraries, com public libraries, uh, being transforming through technology. And one of our libraries are in Ro Roraima, in the, uh, in the border, and their initiative was starting digital empowerment classes for refugees. Um, and I, I mentioned that because uh, when we empower uh, low-income community through technology, they will do the choices about how is the best action to do. So, w one important thing for Brazil in the world is the libraries, because they are, are uh, 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 they are operating, the government are uh, sending uh, source to having librarians and things like that, but they are, most of them are uh, stopping the time, are old school, places only with books, and books is great, but uh, what the young people want to have in our days is more than books, or books and technology. So connecting these two uh, points, I think, is, is important. If, and this is the kind of changing that we are doing in the libraries in Brazil. Project a vision about uh, libraries change makers, and helping them using technology to impact their reality. And I think this is, uh, uh, so I, I can share more about this, our experience with uh, 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 this, uh, this uh, thing. And also what the professor said is, my reflection is, technology is not good or bad. We, uh, humans, we are good or bad. If we are using technology in the right way, we do have a very powerful weapon uh, and we can change lives and changing communities and changing our society through this uh, kind of technology. Thank you. Uh, would you like to add anything? Uh, I would like to add just this point. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, I wanted to answer your question about um, the negative part of technology because I'm a technology educator and that also hurts us. Also, I mean, in Bangladesh we have Rohingya refugee where rumors were spread over Facebook. So we, we, we are actually facing problems. There are, I mean, youth problems. Many, many problems are ongoing. So what we think is when a child is born, we give them education about how to be a, re I mean, responsible citizen. But we don't, we have not taught them how to be a responsible digital citizen. So that's that's where we have to be. I mean, because technology has spread over before we got ready about it. So I think that's that's where we. Because I have seen people making comments on a social media, they would not really f say it face to face. They will be more rude. They will do things we normally don't do in the real world. So we have to, I mean, we have to start talking about it. That's a very good concern. We have to talk more about it and, I mean, raise concerns. Thank you. Okay, yeah, 
Very briefly, yes. Um, it's very good points um, in rebuttal here, and I have to say. But um, but I think, uh, Professor, you, you you raise a very very valid point, and and uh, you know th there is an issue. I think we need to bear in mind the internet is 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 you know less than 20 years old. It's a it's a teenager still, and you know we know what teenagers are like. So um, yeah, it's got a lot of learning to do, and this is where this new thinking we need to we need to look at it differently. Um, it's also interesting to see Tim Berners Lee, um, you know, the original founder of the internet, is rethinking the internet now as well. So uh, watch Solid. You know, that's going to be interesting. He's coming up with some really clever ideas to do that. So all is not lost. It's not all negative. <laughs> there's, a, there's a, the, you know, these, these uh, key problems um, can be addressed. And it's, I think the key message is that it's us, not, not the tech. Thank you. A very